Hey everybody, this is Ian Thornley. You're watching Loud Guitars. Hey guys, Drew from Loud Guitars. I'm sitting here with Ian Thornley, who is touring in support of Albatross. Killing new record now, by the way. Love it. Really love it. Um, Big gaps between the tiny pictures and the, and the, the record after. Uh, what were you doing in between? The um, we did a lot of touring. Um, yeah, there was a lot. I mean, there were a lot of changes that have taken place as well. Um, personal and 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 sort of business-wise, we we changed labels, and I think with a lot of the things that have happened in the last few years, it was. It all just came to a to a head as a, I wanted to sort of close the chapter of the Thornley thing, at least for now. And uh, and and calling this album a big record album was was a great way to do it. Plus, obviously the uh, the addition and sort of rekindling of um, the relationship between Brian and I has uh, you know has been a, a good way to sort of give everything a breath of fresh air, you know. And speaking of Brian, uh, did you guys collaborate a lot on writing this record? No, not really. Um, <clears throat> I think I think a lot of the songs were were already written. Um, but as far as in the studio um, and recording, it's, we've always had a sort of a, a, a good rapport. Um, and I think we we like a lot of the same things, we go for a lot of the same sounds. Um, and certain parts or certain tunings or certain overdubs that you can, you know, with the, our trick bags are very similar as far as, you know, what we would, you know, what I'd do here is obviously use a strat with a small stone into an AC30. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it was one of those kind of things and every once in a while we sort of surprise one another with, a, with an idea or a new trick that we'd come up with. And, uh, so as far as how the record comes across, I think you know it's a, his his presence was essential because um, there's nothing stock about any of the sounds, you know. Um, and certainly there was some not heated arguments at all, but some some discussions were were had over uh, whether or not this this a drum sound or that bass sound was appropriate or you know things like that. It's um, yeah, it's it's as far as the writing, no, but as far as the Putting the thing together, definitely. Inspirational sound wants to have another guitar player to bounce off. Of yeah, who yeah. Can like Ian, you're killing it. Don't change it. That's it. You're done. Like take the take the painting away from the kid, as it were, right? Um, now you attended Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Before Berkeley, did you have a good sense that you had a natural talent for what it is you were doing? Yeah, I, I'd been playing piano since I was about five. Um, I picked up the guitar real late, like 16, 17. Um, yeah, and it was just sort of, it was more of a hobby. I was more into basketball. There was a few years there in my sort of early teens where, I mean, I played in bands and stuff on keyboards when I was a wee kid. Um, and then, uh, yeah, there was a few years where I kind of stopped playing music altogether. I mean, it's, you're, as a teenager, music is really important. It certainly was to me, listening to it. Um, and being really, you know, it's, it's like your best friend in a lot of ways, you know. Um, but then it, I had, a, I had a, a great friend when I was about 17 who was a guitarist. And uh, he started showing me a couple things. My, my, my dad had bought me a little acoustic that it was sitting in the closet. Um, and he's like, oh, yeah, a guitar. And he started showing me a couple of chords. And before I knew it, it was like, well, when I do this, it sounds just like that. You know, um, much different than piano is a. You can kind of do the same thing, but it's. I don't know. It's just something about the, the guitar. Maybe just when I was a teenager. Um, yeah, it's just uh, as far as having an inkling to. If I, if I had a gift or anything, I could always pick things up off the radio as a, as a kid, or off the TV. You know, and a pretty good ear. You know, pretty good memory for melodies and chord changes and stuff like that. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, it was pretty clear by the time I'd finished high school that I wasn't really going to be good at anything else. You know? So was it a natural progression to go to Berkeley, or did somebody influence you in that decision? <clears throat> um, yeah, we just started looking around at things that I could, places I could go to study music. Um, there's Interlochen, there's Humber, there's a, there's a, a lot of, there's the GIT and MIT and all that stuff in LA. There's, I mean, there's a lot of great spots. Um, where you can, I, I think the, the main thing was just to be around musicians. For me, I had no, I didn't think I was gonna end up, you know, being a straight ahead jazz guy, you know, playing in jazz bars and, and a big old hollow body. It's just, uh, or, or to be like a super technical kind of, I just, I just wanted to be around musicians and make music, you know. Um, and it's a great environment for that. You meet people from all over the world. Um, and I did. We just all had a passion for music, regardless of if it was straight ahead or if it was fusion or if it was rock and roll or if it was metal or whatever. Um, you know, good music is good music. And being around a lot of kids who are the same age and have the same thirst for knowledge, it's, uh, you know, a lot of cool things can happen. Obviously, Big Rec, like the, when we first started, we were all Berkeley students. Do you feel like Berkeley uh, shaped you as a player being that? Not at all. No, eh? No. Um, no, I was always kind of outside of, of what, the, what a lot of the guys were doing playing-wise. I mean, there was a lot of wonderful uh, technical players and a lot of wonderful, tasty jazz players. Um, and I was sort of doing finger stuff. I didn't start playing with a pick until I met Brian. Really, you know, that was like, that was like, all right. It's just always it kept slipping out of my hands, and because being a piano player, it was like the finger style thing was real, just a natural thing. And even now, I use pick and fingers. Like, it's just more comfortable for me. Um, and that's sort of outside what they would, at least back then in the sort of early mid '90s, what they were, what the part of the curriculum was that it was just like, they weren't, it wasn't shunned upon. It was definitely a little different. Um, so yeah, I, I, I just, you know. Now, when you listen to music, what, what do you find is more important to you? Uh, technique or feel? Feel, no, for well. sure. Um, I think, uh, I don't know, because I, I, I love good technique, too. I just find that something that has a great feel is, that's just me, that's personal taste and opinion. Having said that, there's some guitar work on this last record, but I was a little self-conscious about. It. I'm like, man, you know, what's up with the like 16th note triplets in there? Do we really need those? You know? And it's just like it's flashy, but you know, if it, uh, I guess it kind of suits it, and it and it's fun. We were talking about Guthrie before, and it's like if you can marry the two, you know, I think that's the that's the goal, that's the aim. And I go through waves, you know. Through my career, I've gone through waves of. Uh, there's always more to learn, you know. And then the past couple of years, it's technique things that I've never even s sat down and thought about or whatever. I mean, it's changing strings, using strings. It's changed the tone. Always is the first consideration. But now it's like, well, you can actually hustle a little more on, on this, or you know what I mean? Like, I, it was never really a consideration, but it is now, and it's like, I think uh, I would like, to, the idea is to try and find the perfect marriage of both. Um, and certainly the more you learn, the more you're able to forget. And that's when the feel comes, comes through. As long as that is the ultimate goal, you know, technique is a great way to, to get there, you know? Well, I think personally, I mean, from the beginning, I mean, you have married. I mean, you have such well, a vast vocabulary, that. and I mean, I know of your playing since the very beginning, and I can honestly say that you've had a fairly long career, mm -hmm. not a ton of records, but the thing is, is that if you go back and listen to all that stuff, I mean, for me personally, and a lot of people I know as well, there isn't a song on there that is not hyper-creative, mm -hmm. you know, that marries both feel 
uh, talents, textures, uh, yeah. the, the whole nine yards. Thanks, man. You know, That's so nice to hear. That's great uh, to hear. And with people as careers as Molly's careers, I mean, you've got 15, 16, 17 records. Mm. You can't say that about them. Good track yeah. here, good track there. But there's a, a consistency and a flow of that marriage of tone, you know, uh, feel and extreme technique. Yeah, it's, well, the, yeah, I appreciate that. And that's definitely, I mean, it's, is it a conscious thing for me? No, I, I think uh, there were, it's always easy to say it's just a snapshot of where I was at the time. But some of these songs have been sitting around for, or not songs, some of these ideas have been sitting around for years. And they still haven't found a home. Um, I was playing something sitting before soundcheck, much like right now, a couple days ago, and something just popped up. Um, and I was running through my guitar rig, and, it, and it's an old, an old riff. I just never found a home. I had a verse of written and everything, and I tried maybe nine or ten different courses on it before I was like, ah, next. And it's like, well, there's still something there. So I think it's just, uh, I think it's just, it, it, it's just a search, right? It's just, uh, you know, that's where the, the sort of discipline comes into not giving up on it and not saying that's hey, good enough, you know? So, until you get, until you get yourself off and you're like, when you get, chicken skin from listening to your own music that's hopefully other people will dig it too you know but uh, until then I, th I think there was a couple couple instances um, on the Thornley records where I really didn't get that I was you know sort of cutting out some things and maybe not going for all the things that I normally would and uh, I just sort of feel like let down when I listen to it now you know so, at the time, totally kick-ass, this is great. It's gonna be huge. <laughs> and it's, I just f would find myself turning it louder and louder and louder to get into it, when normally it's like, it shouldn't really have much to do with the volume at the end, it should be the quality of the fucking music, you know? A constant search and just, you know. I don't know, I appreciate your comment though. And it's nice to know that there, there are people out there that, that get what, what we're going for. Well, know? it's honest and it's coming from a guy who plays and, and like, it's not, I, I totally mm -hmm. respect everything you do. It. And it gives me those feelings while I'm here, it's still to this day, even in memory, you know? Like, yeah. uh, awesome stuff. Thanks, bro. Um, shifting gears a bit, uh, you have a ton of guitars. And do you find that if you put some away for a while and you go back, open up a case, pull it out, and sit Big down time. with it, that it inspires and oh, yeah, yeah, for you, yeah. new ideas, new riffs? Big time. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, there are some, that's the problem is that some, you, you, you start to gravitate towards a certain number of guitars for a certain number of purposes. Well, this is my open C guitar, this is my low B guitar, this is my etc. but this is my slide guitar. And it's like, well, wait a second, all you got to do is bump the bridge up, put 13s on it, and you got a slide guitar. You can do it to any, any, you know, at least the way I like to play slide. So anything can be inspiring. You never know where it's going to come from or where it's going to happen. And that often happens to me where it's just you pick up a guitar that you haven't picked up in a while and, uh, you know, might be in a tuning you haven't used in a while or just playing a, a simple bar chord on this thing for some reason sounds different and sparks a new idea. <clears throat> so no, it happens all the time. That, that's what I tell my wife well, as more guitars come through the front door, you know. Do you it's, find yourself for ideas, honey? Do you find yourself picking up a lot of new gear on tour? Uh, not, not so much, man. It's you know, if I had more dough, I would. Um, yeah, it's just it is a. I just love them all. You know. They all have a, a, a unique voice and, a, and they speak to me in a different way, and hopefully speak through me in a different way you know? um, and I have deep relationships with, with a lot of them but, uh, that some, that some, a lot of them aren't, aren't out now because of that relationship if I would have lost them I don't know what I would do you know? they're like family members now Ian talking about Del, um, what are your feelings on the, on the music industry today the way things have changed because of the internet and the download and uh, yeah. the accessibility of you know, being able to record from your screen and so on and so forth. And what's that? What that's done to to record sales? Well, it's made it 
really hard to make a living um, doing this. And I'm really lucky to be able to make a living. There's a lot of guys who are way more kick-ass than me that, that can't. Um, it's Yeah, it's just made it really hard. It's a double-edged sword. And I think that's pretty much the standard issue answer for a lot of guys because it really is. That's the only way to put it. It's like, well, it's a great way to reach a lot more people in a lot less time. Um, but yeah, it's... It's, it's been certainly hard on the, on the wallet. But it's also, um, <clears throat> I'm seeing people in the audience with the, with the camera phones. Is, I mean, I'm coming around and I'm trying to, I really am putting out a concerted effort to not snap every time I see it, because it's just, it pulls you out of your zone. It's a vibe kill. Um, having said that, if they're doing it from the back and I don't see them, you know, then there's the question of, well, what if, I, what if I'm sick, you know? And, and, my voice isn't all there, then it's, it's going to go up and people are going to say like, wow, they suck, you know, or if the sound is like really bad on one of those, if he's in the wrong spot of the room, there's just a lot of variables that you wish you could uh, sort of control, but you can't. Um, and having said that, man, it's, I think you got to take it all with a grain of salt, anything that I watch on YouTube, and of course I'm guilty of, you know, I'm a big fan of a lot of guys that I want to check out what they're doing. And, I take all that into consideration, and it's like, well, I'm sure that's not how he intended it, intended it to sound. Um, and everybody has an off night. Um, I just, I'm really bummed when it's like, if I just do something I've never done before, and it was kick ass, where were the cameras then? They never seemed to be around. It's kind of funny because Guthrie, uh, we talked about him before, and he had the same thing to say about that. You know? yeah. and, uh, we all have off nights, and why is it that... That guy uh, doesn't have off nights. Give me a break. Uh, Guthrie doesn't have off nights. I want one of his off nights. In, in his mind, he has off yeah. nights, and he had the same thing to say. It's like you never have a choice anymore. Yeah. It's there, and there's nothing to do. Yeah, you just got to deal with it. You got to roll with it. I just say, you know, it can be such a magical thing. That sounds kind of kind of flighty and cosmic to say that, but I mean, music is a pretty magical thing. And when it's done right, and the audience and everything together, when it's all done, like those magical nights when the audience gets off and you get off and it's just, you get to sort of go somewhere else. Um, there's a lot of eyes closed kind of moments. When you open them and there's an iPhone in your face, it's a bit of a buzzkill, you know? It's like, whoa, really, man, really? What kind of faces was I making? Like, how do these jeans look on me? Like, all of these, you're thinking about, like, you know, it's a, you know, how do, we're not here to make a video. We're here to play music and and share music and, and, and you know, try it's, to. It's the new generation, the instant, uh, the instant. Yeah, everything. and I get that. I'm down with that. You know, I've got it. I think I'm developing ADD. You know, you should hear me DJ when I'm. Uh, when we're driving down the highway, I never get to the end of a song until it's like, ooh, you know, it's like 8,000 songs on my iPod, and I want to try and hear them all. Um, this is a, a personal thing for me on the recording aspect of things. I notice uh, on, except for the first record, uh, and even the Thornley records, there are a bunch of tracks. You, you record most of the stuff to tape, right? And then don't? Uh, no. It's all digital? That's, the last record's all digital, yeah. The last record's all digital. Yeah. But the records before that. The reason why I ask is because I notice on a lot of the tracks, not all of them, that the tape has been really pushed, mm. saturated to a point where you almost hear in the recording of the overall thing yeah. a little bit of saturation. Not, I don't yeah. want to say distortion, but you no, know. No, I know what you mean. Um, the first record was tape. Second record was tape to Pro Tools. Um, and then it was. The, the rest of his Pro Tools, I don't think, I, I think we, we were talking about using like a one inch machine or something like that on Come Again. And, and also on Tiny Pictures, Nick was, I think Nick was using some trickery when he was mixing. Okay, now was it a, a conscious thing to push those tracks to oh, a yeah, point yeah. of saturation? Like, oh yeah, yeah. Were you almost hear distortion on the tracks? Yeah. Because you don't hear anybody else do that. Yeah. Like, no, at all. Oh, of course. No, all the, all the sonic little bits that, that are for guys like you and me are all conscious. Uh, yeah. It's, or if they're an accident. They're left in consciously, for sure. Like, not much is getting by um, a guy like Eric Ratz or, or Nick Raskinis, you know. And, you know, those guys have, like, hawk ears. You know, they hear 
in, in the studio, do you record your beds or um, the, the rhythm parts of the tracks with the drummer and the bass player? Um, that's generally the way you'd like to do it. Um, and certainly on this last record, I wanted, we, we knew the, how we wanted it to feel. And we wanted it to feel like that. You know, a little bit of mic bleed and, you know, things like that. I, just hearing the little ghosts. Um, is it, is it, to me, is important. I got that sense try from, from Albatross, that track. I mean, was that recorded? The um, I, I, think we, I think we would generally find the, you know, get the tempo that really works for it. I mean, the tempos were changing during pre-production, you know, one or two BPM either direction. Um, so, yeah, we'd get the tempo and then, uh, and then, yeah, I, I, think, I think Dave and I would, would lay down the guitar and the bass together. And then if I wanted to double something for a chorus or whatever, to add a, some vibe, and, and, then, and then Chris would lay down the, the drums to what we play. And I do a scratch vocal, of course. Um, so it's sort of in, in uh, limited time funds and real estate studio-wise that we had. I think that was, I think we, uh, we did as much of that as possible. The video for Albatross was done in that room, basically? No, that's at Catherine North. That's at uh, Danny Aiken's place in, uh, in Hamilton. Nice room. That's a great room. It's a great studio, great people, great vibe. Um, and I'd love to do some recording there for sure. But no, it was done at Vespa in Toronto, which is about half that size. Um, how long did you guys rehearse uh, for, this, uh, for this tour? For the tour? Uh, we did two weeks several months ago and then did two days of sort of you know with the inner monitors and the whole bit um did two days right before we flew out to uh to vancouver because you had just come off of touring with brian not long before that right mm. you guys were touring for quite a bit um no it's we we've been we've been quiet for a while i think it was the occasional one-off just one off right? Yeah, but before that it was, uh, no, we did the Big Wreck slash Thornley right. run, which was a lot of fun. It was fantastic. They're great shows. You do a set of Thornley music, take it like a 10 minute break and come back and do a set of Big Wreck music, which was which was wonderful. We changed the backdrops and the whole bit. It was fun. And this unit as it is right now, you feel 100% good about it? Everything's 150% good about it, yeah. I mean, it's... Uh, it's great, man. It's you're having a blast. All the, you, we're all having a blast, and everybody's getting along like a house on fire. It's uh, there's no no weird vibes, and that's important, man. Is that like being on the road? It's I think that's what that, not paying attention to that stuff is. I think that's what would probably cause the demise of Big Rack in the first place, the first incarnation of it, if you will, is, is um, letting that stuff go, I'm saying eh, whatever, deal with it later. And then, you know, not talking to that person or those people until like five minutes before you go on stage and you go play and then you go, you, you know what I mean? At the end of the day, it's like a marriage, right? It trying is indeed. Make, it make is indeed. And this is, I like couldn't, I, I could not be happier. It just, uh, musically, it's on a, on a level I've never, I've never been lucky enough to, to play with this many guys who are at the top of their game um, and going up. Uh, every night is, is, is better. Thank you so much for taking the time to sit with us, man. Great, Great record. Model. I love it. I was thrilled to meet you, man. And, uh, Thanks, buddy. Thanks. Appreciate it.